right. Um, our, our goal over the next few classes is to uh, sharpen up our skills for some of the form controls that exist and for writing code behinds and then refactoring those code behinds so that we have better code behinds. So what we'll do is we'll start off with the example we had last time. We'll talk a bit about it and we'll go from there. All right. Um, so let me download that example. example we had last time was to do a little tip calculation and let's spend a minute to review it and then we'll add some things to it and go from there. You ain't kidding it's cold in here. thing to repeat, when you go and open this, you can't open the files directly. That will open them up in Visual Studio, but you don't want to treat the files as individual files. You want to treat the whole app together. So you need to open the entire app. So we'll go here and all programs, start Visual Studio. sure to select an open website so that we get the whole package. All right. Um, you know, we're going to need the um, web config file and everything. We want to just treat it like an application. So we can't just open the files individually and then run in debug mode. So we'll go to open, website, pick it, and then open. Now remember, when you do this, it needs to be the folder that contains the web config file. So occasionally, just depending on how people zip things up or, or whatever, you may have like a folder inside a folder or something like that. It needs to be the folder that contains the web config file. So that's this folder. So I'll open it up, and I'm ready to roll. Now, if you recall this example from last time, we had a page that allowed you to enter an amount in, um, enter a level of service, and choose whether it was um, dine-in or carry-out. And then based on those things, it did a calculation of the tip. Based on the rule that, 
There's no tip on. Um, oh wait, a minute. there's no tip if the surface is poor. There's a 15% tip if it's average. There's a 20% tip if it's excellent. Actually, I did not take into account whether it was carry out yet. Okay, so we'll do that this time. We'll, we'll go and add that code in there. Yes. Doesn't the uh, the second if statement there need to be a capital A? Doesn't the second if statement need to be a capital A? Ah, must have been, yeah. Okay. Yeah, because I was running through debug last time. All right. So, let's run it. Notice that we have validation. So that they have to enter an amount. What's more, they have to enter a numeric amount. All right. We don't have validation for these two because right now we really can't. All right. The quality of service, we only have those three options there. And it has to be one of the three, right? Um, a dropdown always has a selected value in, in HTML. Uh, if you don't specify one, it's going to be the initial one on the list. Now, depending on your application, that may or may not be a good thing, all right? Depending on the particular, particular problem that you're working on. In this case, is it a good idea to default the service to poor? That's probably a pretty pessimistic attitude, right? What would you default the service to? Or would you default the service at all? Average. You might default it to average. You know, it's average for a reason. All right. Let's see how we do that. Yes? Unless you had one at the top that said, uh, please select an option in the box. That would be another choice. You could, you could put sort of a dummy answer on the top that says, please select an option. So let's look at doing it both ways. All right. If you don't do anything, it's going to be the top option. All right. And that's probably, in this case, not a good idea from a design perspective. Again, always have your designer hat on, too. In other words, don't just figure, well, I need a drop down. Figure out, well, how is this form going to be most useful? Yes? Is there a way to validate whether they've changed the, d the dummy text on the Dropbox or the dummy? Yeah, and okay. we'll look at that. Okay. Yeah, we'll look at that in a second. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to just default it to average. All right, how do I do that? I can go into my list of items, edit items, and I can put under average, I can say that that is the one that's selected. All right, now it will default to average when I run. If you had had something selected before, would that change everything? Check. Just changing one, would that change the other one? That no clue. Selected? In other words, if you if you said all of them were selected? Yeah. Um, I don't know. <laughs> um, my guess is, is that it would either go back and change all of them to unselected, or it would set multiple of them uh, uh, as selected in which case, probably the last one that was selected would hold. All right. Can you show what you just did again? Just now with that. Yeah. I went in here, under Edit Items, and I just picked that guy as selected. Let's take an optimistic view and change it to excellent to answer your question. Yeah. It kept average as selected, too which means that um, it's going to pick one of them. W whether it picks the first or the last, I don't know. So, that is, uh, that's if you have a default. And again, you don't create a default just so that you uh, uh, can get out of validating, right? 
you create a default if the default really makes sense for the particular thing. For example, considering your tuition uh, calculation assignment, your next assignment, is there anything that makes sense to default in that? Lorraine County. Yeah, it probably makes sense to, to default to Lorraine County. Um, I'm sure there's some statistics there, and I'm sure the statistics would point to the fact that, you know, a good percentage, a good majority of the students here at LC are from Lorain County. So it makes sense to default it in that, in that case. It doesn't make sense to default it when there's no clear choice, um, you know, there's no clear choice, say, for the number of credit hours, all right? Or, um, in this case, there's no clear choice, well, Maybe there is a clear choice for level of service, average. That probably is a reasonable choice. But let's say we had a drop down where a student would pick a major. There's no clear choice for that, right? There's probably more popular and less popular majors, right? There's more enrollment and low enrollment. But there's not a major that I would feel comfortable with saying, well, that's the default major. If you don't major in, if you don't change a major, I'm going to assume it's nursing or accounting or whatever. So you pick defaults based on that. So the one approach we did was to put a default here, all right? Um, the other approach that we're going to take is, oops, I'm going to go and remove that default. The other default, the other thing that we can do is we can add a dummy item at the top. And we can go something like, you know, Select level of service. All right. And then we'll put that one as the top item on the list. Because if we don't choose default, all right, if we don't choose uh, a default, it's the top item on the list that gets to be the default. So we'll go and run this, and it's kind of going to work, but not really. All right. In other words, yeah, that's the default, that's what shows, but we shouldn't be able to go in and click calculate if they haven't defined the level of service. In other words, select level of service is like a non-answer. It's like an empty answer. So what we want to do is we want to validate it to make sure they've picked something other than that one. All right? How do you do that? You do that with a required field validator that you tweak a little bit. All right. So let's go in here and let's create our required field validator. All right. And my error message, you know, I'll put in something like must select level of service. I'll say it's associated with this particular control to validate, which is DD service. Down here, I'll put the initial value. And the initial value is the value of the dummy text. All right? In other words, the initial value are the words select level of service. So I'll put that in. Select level of service. All right. Now when I go and run this, if they don't take, they don't set a level of service, I get the validation error and it doesn't go and do the calculation. So the idea again is, is when you specify required field validator, you can, special, you can specify what the initial value is. And if it changes from the initial value, then it's considered to be uh, a value selected or value entered. Otherwise, it's considered to be not a value entered. Now, did you have to like, spell that exactly the same? Yeah. In both places, yeah. same caps? Yeah. Um, you know, I might make it... I might make it simpler if I was doing it for real. You know, I, I might, you know, I might take the time to type NA or something like that that that, that was was just obvious um, at a glance. And if we do select something, 
then it works. All right. Now, refresh our memory. Why do I have if is valid up here? What does that do? I get a sense that that was a little confusing last time. So let's talk about what if is valid means. Yeah. If it runs through all your conditions for double checking they entered everything in that. Yeah. If all the validation controls pass, then it's valid. Otherwise, it's not valid. Now, the reason we put that code in is in case JavaScript is disabled. Because those validation controls run both on the client and on the server. And if they run on the client, then this code won't even be ever reached until the data is valid. All right? If, however, JavaScript was disabled, then the code would run on the server and would want to make sure we don't process it if there is any sort of validation error. Yes? Uh, okay. Really? Go ahead. Oh, I was just wondering how, is val how it knows that just is valid relates to the validation controls. Okay. That's a good question. The question is, is how does is valid uh, know that that means that the validation controls are valid? Pardon me? Is it built in? Yeah, this is just a property built into the page object. Just C sharp or just? No, into, into the ASP.NET framework. Oh, okay. All right? Okay. So, remember, what's the whole idea of a framework? The whole idea of a framework is that it gives you sort of a starting point, a jumping off point. So there's stuff that's built into a framework. All right? And part of understanding the .NET uh, environment and becoming a .NET uh, programmer is learning the stuff that is built into the framework. And this is one particular attribute that's associated with every page, is valid. And that will be true if the validation controls pass. It will be false if any of the validation controls uh, have detected an error. So yeah, that's, that's built in. How do you learn these things? Just over time. All right, this is, this is one example. but. The important thing is, is be aware that there are these attributes out there. So if you're looking at some sort of common functionality or you're looking at something that you think could be true, you know, gee, I would expect there to be something in the framework to address this, then, um, then you have a fighting chance of finding it if you actually go and look, at, look for it. But yeah, that's a, good, that's a very good. So, question. like, say if it didn't pass, we could like put an else statement and saying a message, like maybe displaying a message box saying something's wrong on this page. Well, we actually wouldn't need to because the validation controls would would um, okay. yeah. would would I kick in then and would display the errors. Yeah. So okay. you get the same errors, client side and server side. The difference being that if we got the errors on the client side, then it wouldn't even make it back to the server to run this code. Okay. All right. This code's only there as sort of the, the catch-all to catch if JavaScript is disabled. And then the validation controls kick off and the, the results will be displayed. And then you, uh, you know, but you need to, to stop the rest of the processing if there is an error with the validation. Yes? So the running of those <coughs> validation controls is, is also built in? Yes. And That's a default behavior, is to look through all the validation controls on the page and, and run through their tests. Yes? That's all I'm just wondering so. why this even gets called. If, because if you're saying it, .NET must automatically generate more HTML and send it back to the client so that the client sees those error messages. Okay. I'm not, not fully understanding your question. But I, I think it's an important one because it's, a, it's important to know, to have a sense of how, you know, how the overall flow of these things work and how the client sort of communicates. So, so try, try rephrasing your question. Okay. Let's say JavaScript is disabled. Okay. Time. JavaScript is disabled. So the submit or the click calculate right. <clears throat> comes back to the server. Yes. The server is going to run those validation controls. Right. And then you said, I thought you said, at that point, the client would see the error messages. 
So I'm assuming the server is actually sending some more yes. HTML back. Yes. And it's in Java's disabled. Yes. To put to show those right. messages. So then I'm wondering why even bother call this function. This function gets called if the button is clicked and we've called the server. If we've called the server as a result of the button being clicked, this will get called. Come hell or high water, as they say. Okay. All right? So that will get called. Now, there's other things that get called that are built in the framework, right? The page load event, which is up here, gets called. So there's some code that we can put in every time the page loads. We can do something if we need to. Um, build into the framework, all the validation controls get called. All right? There's a whole mess of stuff that gets called, but one of the things that gets called, regardless if there's a validation error or not, is this on click event. All right? So, um, we know that in the case of the data being invalid, we don't want to do a calculation. All right? But that event still is going to get called, and therefore we still need to go in and keep any real damage from being done. All right, as a result of the validation controls fired off. So to, to answer your question, um, you know, there, there's a mix, you know, these things are part of the framework and, and they get triggered in a certain manner automatically. Um, there's a certain number of things that happen sort of behind the scenes. Those validation controls getting fired off is one of them. And there's certain things that, that happen that we kind of have control over. And this is one of those, the on-click event, all right? Um, but it happens in a certain sequence, and um, if the page, regardless of whether the, the validation controls detected an error or not, that code's going to try to execute. Okay. Look at it this way, and, and I, don't, I don't know if this will help you. You know, you, you, can, you, you can look at it a couple different ways, you know. That's the way it is, we just have to deal with it. <laughs> it's one way, one way to look at it. The other way is, imagine if it was the other way. Imagine if, it, if this code didn't run, all right, uh, when the validation controls uh, had an error, all right? And let's imagine that was built in the framework. It would be impossible then to write some code here, all right, to do anything would be locked out of doing any sort of processing if those validation controls failed. All right? Um, we may want the flexibility to do some processing on the server. You know, if anything, you know, tell them, you know, this is your third attempt or, you know, something like that, you know. So we might want to run some code here. By having this, this event firing off automatically, we then have the flexibility to say, yeah, we can do some code. No, we don't want to do some code. If it was built in the framework, then we could never run any code here. So. Can you check anything more specific than is valid? Like, could you check individual controls? You could, but there's really no need to, right? Because part of the validation control's job is, if there's an error, it's going to display the error text. So, um, I, you know, I suppose there could be some case where you'd want to know specifically what validation control kicked in, but for the purposes of informing the user, that's already taken care of for you. Because if that validation control gets an error, it's popping up the error message. So, that'll happen. All right? Yes? When you just said you could send them a message saying this is your third attempt or something? Yeah, like that, I guess. Would that be where, like... Is this where you would do it if you kick somebody out, if you only let them Yeah, um, again, I, I can't imagine a real sort of, of validation like this um, where, where you'd do this. But yeah, you could have some logic on this else statement to say, if it's valid, do this, otherwise do something else. But yeah, that, that's where you, you would do it. Yeah, I guess. You, you could do something like that. Normally, for this sort of validation, you know, you, you know, there's other kinds of validation you give people a limited number of tries, like password attempts or whatever. That's what I meant. Yeah. Even if it were that. Would yeah. custom control, uh, custom validate control, do that work? Um, it could.
could you make, yeah, you could do something with that probably. Okay. All right. Okay. So, I, I think those are discussions that are important because it, if, how do I want to say this? Stuff will be surprising to you if you don't really understand the way the client and server are talking to each other. All right? So therefore, any sort of these questions, and these questions that, that you're asking really is sort of of the nature of, you know, gee, how, are, how is a client and server engaging with each other? And in this particular case, the server goes, the validation controls are run, if there's errors, it generates the HTML to do that, it will try to do this button click event, and then it will send all of its results to the browser, all right? And then the cycle can start over again. All right, yes? This might be getting way beyond where mm -hmm. I'm going to go today, but um, is there like an instance of this for each client that you're um, interacting with? Is there an instance of what? Uh, well, I don't know what class we're inside here, but... We're, we're, in, we're in the code behind for the page. For the page. Okay, yeah. well, you might have a thousand yep. clients out there accessing that mm -hmm. same page. And so if you were doing a count of how many times one particular mm -hmm. page tried, you know, kept submitting and was invalid, mm -hmm. um, I'm just wondering how do you know Is there one of these uh, pages for each client that's accessing well, it at the time? Well, let's think this through, all right? Let's think this through. And let's think that this is not, this is not, you know, something silly like a tip calculator. Let's say it's something more substantial like um, checking out from Amazon, all right? So same idea, same sort of thing. There's a form that you enter in. Different stuff on the form, different blah, 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 blah. Let's think about this. Let's try to think it through, perform a thought experiment. And let's think what would happen if there was only one instance of this stuff for everyone that was using it. That would take up a massive amount of space. Well, maybe, maybe not. Let's say, forget, uh, uh, don't think like a programmer here, think practically. Okay. If we shared a shopping cart, if we went to Giant Eagle and shared a shopping cart, all right, forget about the web, all right, what would happen? We'd all get the same stuff, right? Or only one of us would get it. Or only one of us would get it, or something bad would happen, all right? <laughs> you, know, you know that that's not going to have a good outcome, all right? Here's where the analogy maybe falls apart a, a, a little bit. So the idea is, is something has to know this is this person's credit card as far uh, as opposed to that person's credit card. This is the items that this person wants to purchase. This is the items that that person wants to purchase. This is uh, this person's ship to information. This is that person's ship to information. So the fact that there's going to be stuff that is true about a session, all right, implies that, yeah, there's, there's essentially separate instances of these things uh, for each person. Because otherwise, you could do a Google search and get someone else's search results or anything goofy like that. Yes? For Amazon, even if you use different delivery addresses and different credit cards, wouldn't it be tracking your IP address if you use the same computer? Probably not IP address. Huh? No, but the idea is that somehow Amazon, regardless of the, the specifics of it, somehow Amazon knows that it's you, all right? You log on, right, to Amazon. So Amazon knows that it's you, all right? And it doesn't confuse then you with me. I get my purchases, you get yours. That implies that there's multiple instances. Yes? Google takes it one step further, and they, I think they do cookies or track your, I, I think they track your IP address. But when you go on there, if someone else goes and logs in your account from somewhere that's not normal, they'll actually send you a message saying, 